Welcome and well met. I am the Quonset Manager and you are watching the next installment of the Great Bear Island Tourist Information Kiosk video series. This episode is the third video out of three on the Great Bear Railway. We continue our story at the Tunnel to Forlorn Muskeg. Before we get into this, I want to sum up what my theory is as to what happened to the rest of the railway. At the time of the 2012 earthquake, a train was traveling down the tracks. I will describe how I think that fateful trip unfolded. Starting at the point where I believe the train was when the earthquake began, we see four log hauling flatbeds. These were smashed to the side and dislodged from the rest of the train by a falling tree. Why were the logs abandoned? I suspect that there just wasn't a need for it. You would have to have a bunch of men drag the logs to the loading area, so why not just collect new logs instead? There's no rubble in the tunnel that we can see. It's just snow buildup. However, the snow could have built up on top of any rubble, so it's hard to tell if the tunnel itself is unstable. Now, my theory is that at the time of the earthquake, the train was hauling cargo and at a fairly nice clip. As the first tremor hit, the rear end of the train got hit by the falling tree and the four cars detached. Ask yourself, if you're in an earthquake and your train just got hit by falling trees, do you stop your train in a tunnel? Hell to the no. If the water pools in Forlorn Muskeg, so this tunnel must go downhill from Mystery Lake. The driver, he's just entering the tunnel, it's going downhill, and so what does he do? He throws the throttle into full steam ahead. The train flies out of the tunnel like a bat out of hell, and just as he comes clear of the tunnel, he slams on the brakes. Bad idea. The train tracks were already screwed up from the earthquake, and the sudden braking combined to cause a large number of boxcars to derail. And thus we had the formation of the poacher's camp. Not a lot of people come through the area. And thus... Also why we don't find a lot here. They would have to be rather frugal as they were poaching. Also, they wouldn't want to leave any evidence behind just in case somebody came by to investigate. It is a good base camp, but not the best, specifically due to its proximity to so many wolves and the bear that spawns nearby. Still, let us investigate the area a bit. Now, these are all boxcars. And nearby we find a backpack. Occasionally you can find clothing for the head slot next to it. For the longest time in coming down the tracks, I never checked behind the train cars. The bear discouraged me from doing so. You should take the time. Even though the bear does often come out as soon as you get into the area, make a quick sweep behind the boxcars. There is a box there and a soda spawn that can be a lifesaver. Further along, there's some wood that spawns as well, which honestly I wish I had known about on one particularly bad luck dash through the area. Of course, that brings us to the train car itself. The inside is often jam-packed with stuff, as well as a much-needed fire barrel. Once inside, you are no longer accessible to the animal AI pathing system, so as long as you have something to burn, you have shelter from the wind and a place to rest before moving on to the broken railroad or the forge. Now, heading to the forge, make a wide sweep of the area. There will almost always be some coal scattered about or inside the boxcar. Unfortunately, it's not the respawning kind. Now, the poacher's camp raises a question. What were they poaching? We have bears, deers, and wolves. There's also rabbits, but they're not easily accessible from this area. And frankly, you can only poach so many bears. So I'm assuming that the wolves are the primary target here. This camp has obviously been here for years, therefore the wolves have had years to learn that humans are dangerous. So maybe that would be the reason for them being so angry at every human they see. If this is the case, we now know who to blame for making the wolves so hostile. These damn poachers. Now further down the tracks, we come to our next point of interest. So what happened here? Let's look at this from the perspective of the driver. Our driver now knows braking is bad, so he lets off to avoid stopping too fast. Unfortunately, eh, there's a bit of a break in the rails. However, I think this was due to neglect, not to the 2012 earthquake. I think perhaps the flaw originally may have uh, started in the pre-Aurora earthquake, and Erosia finished the job, but 
I don't believe this broken section was here during the 2012 earthquake. Now the next derailment is all logging cars. This makes sense. If the train had multiple different types of cars, then the weak spots would be where they joined up. All the boxcars would link together better because they're from the same manufacturer. The flatbeds, same thing, but from another manufacturer, therefore they link together well, but the connections between two different types, that would probably be a point of failure. Now that would explain why so many flatbeds are found at this end of the forlorn muskeg. This derailment seems to have been caused again by a toppling tree. I suspect it fell as the earthquake continued. When that happened, all these flatbeds detached and the train continued on. Not much to see here, but if you travel this section in story mode, we can find this guy. It looks like he just gave up and sat down next to this shrub. What do we know about him? Well, he left us a note. Judging from the amount of blood frozen to this page, the author wasn't doing too well when they wrote it. First, it was the expletive rancid meat, then the sprained ankle, then the expletive convict out of nowhere gave him the slip by falling down into a damn ravine. Of course, that's when the expletive wolves came. Dropped my stuff and ran, as much as I could with a sprained ankle. If you are reading this, this is as far as I got. Should have never tried to leave Milton. So let's try and figure out what happened here. We know from talking to Grey Mother that a whole lot of people made a break for it. Now, this guy, he ate some bad meat, got food poisoning, bumped into one of the convicts, he fell into a ravine. Now, which ravine? I think what he's talking about is actually the Mountain Town Basin area. Yes, there are death walls all around the area in story mode. However, I found a map glitch and spent several days probing the death walls and invisible barriers around the Mountain Town Basin and eventually found a way in. A curious search around the place revealed nothing spawns there except for these two containers and one chair that I broke up for wood at the old hermit hack. From there, I went on to the transition to Forlorn Muskeg, and yes indeed, you can transition there. Of course, it's blocked off from the other side, but we have to assume that these invisible barriers don't apply to NPCs. I suspect the guy went straight, missed the cave behind the waterfall, and tried to mountain goat down the cliffside, which would have put him face to face with about two to four wolves. Assuming when he did what he wrote, I bet he made it all the way to this disrailment before, well, Discovering that there was no shelter there. That's probably the point where he finally gave up. Now then, it's a sad story, but it seems to be probably pretty typical of what's happened to most of the people who tried to get out of Milton. So, moving along. At the next tunnel, we have signs of collapse. The tunnel clearly had not collapsed before the train arrived, but I assume that it was looking really shaky. So, as a driver, if I was still moving forward when I hit this spot, especially since the rear part of my train just got hit by another tree, I would instead hit the gas again. I would not want to get stuck in the tunnel, which obviously was in the process of at least partially collapsing. Moving on to Broken Railroad. Here we have some fallen trees. I suspect that just happened over the years and did not happen during the first earthquake. Next we come to a landslide. This is very important because it explains the power lines. The power lines were down all along the track and no attempt was made to repair them. Why? Well, here we have why. The power lines go under the landslide. Now when did this occur? I'm betting it happened during the 2012 earthquake. In fact, I bet it happened because the train was roaring past as the ground was shaking. The barrier may have held otherwise, except the additional vibrations would have been just enough to push it past the point of failure. As we know the landslide happened after the train passed, because we find it further down the tracks, we know at some point the driver must have said, screw it, and just hit the brakes. This caused the remaining cars behind him to partially derail, and the engine finally came to a stop. This would be the end of the train's story at this time. This is not the end of the tracks. The destroyed power lines also, for some reason, stop here. You'd think that they'd be lying around somewhere because all the other power lines were abandoned. A bit later, they are reconnected, but only down to the maintenance yard. Sections of the line are missing. I think that they took the wire down and used it to hook up the generator that they have in the yard. I'll go into the maintenance yard another time. Back to the rail, we find another passenger car, a truck on the side of the tracks, and a collapsed bridge. This is as far as we can go. I suspect that there's a great deal more civilization past that broken train bridge. 
I think that anyone working at the maintenance yard commuted from that direction and the passenger car was used for said transportation. I think that it was just sitting there when the Aurora earthquake happened. This would mean that the Aurora tremor is what collapsed the bridge. So why is the truck here? I suspect somebody drove up to see what was going on. What happened to the driver? Well, someone left us a note inside. This letter appears to have been written in charcoal and is smeared with dirt. I have been stuck in this damn truck for eight hours while those wolves circle. I'm not sure I'll be able to get to the supply stash I left along the rail line in the marsh. Curiouser and curiouser. At first glance, this might seem to be from a driver, because we find it inside the cab. But why would a maintenance worker have charcoal on him? And why would a maintenance worker need to have a supply stash? A supply stash and the use of charcoal would indicate a survivor, not somebody who had just experienced the aurora. I suspect the original driver came up here to see what was going on. I think that his truck got stuck, or maybe he got out to look around and see what was happening. What happened to the original driver? Don't know. I think he may have looked at the bridge. Maybe it collapsed under him. Maybe he's the dead guy we found down in the ravine below. Maybe he's one of the many other dead bodies we find littering the area. We can't be certain of what his eventual fate was. I like to think the driver got up here and left his engine running because it was cold and got out to look around. Then he noticed the bridge was looking particularly unstable and realizing that it probably couldn't drive across it, he made a break for it. I like to think that he just made it across as the bridge dramatically crumbled beneath his feet. I suspect that eventually he made it back home. There he found his wife and a darling little moppet of a daughter. Knowing that things were going to get pretty bad, he packed them up with all the supplies he could find and made it down to a little known cove where he used to play as a child. There he knew that there was a shallow draft pocket cruiser in dry dock. A shallow draft pocket cruiser would have no problem getting out to sea and is sail powered so it wouldn't have any issues with the aurora. He lucked out because the aurora quake and the high tide combined to break up the ice enough that he could make for open water and head back to the mainland where he found a capsized tuna trawler on shore with a cargo hold partially filled with fish. And at this point in the story, he and his family are making shelter there, eating the fish as they formulate their plans for what to do next. Now why do I think all this happened? Because goddammit, statistically speaking, there has to be at least one positive outcome for someone on this goddamn blasted island. But chances are he just froze to death. Alas, that still leaves the note unexplained. To explain the note, we need a second person, specifically a forest talker. Someone who would use charcoal and need a supply stash. Now what happened to him? I imagine it went something like this. He got chased up here by wolves and got inside the truck. Time passed and the wolves didn't leave. Eventually, he had to make a break for it. He got attacked, got bit, scared off the wolf, made it inside. He patched himself up and tried to make a break for it again, but this time during an aurora. And he noticed the strange wolves were glowing, as well as the fact that they were scared off by light. That would make him the one to write, they hate the light on the wall. Personal note, why write they? Why not just write wolves hate the light? Seriously or glowing wolves hate the light. This sort of pronoun crap could get someone killed. That's why I'm glad the guy's dead. In fact, I suspect he's the dead body we trip over in story mode. Bastard couldn't even write a proper warning for people. Frankly, the idiot deserved to die, if you ask me. And on that happy note, we wrap up this, the third and final video about the Great Bear Island Railway. I hope you found this video to be informative as well as helpful. Sorry for the delay getting this out to everyone, but you know how things are on the island. Thank you for stopping by the Bear Island Tourist Kiosk. Be sure to stop by the Quonset Garage if you find yourself needing any supplies. Just remember our motto, Quonset Garage, where the water is always free.